Namaskar and good evening. I welcome you all on behalf of Symbiosis International, Dimmed University, and Symbiosis Law School Noida. We are delighted to inform Symbiosis Law School Noida, in collaboration with NV Poll, Lex Witness, India's first magazine on legal and corporate affairs, and Satgamaya, is organizing a panel discussion on climate mitigation and adaptation through courts and policy. The object of the webinar is to impart basic practical knowledge about climate adaptation and the role of courts and intergovernmental organizations and how the same affects policy to combat climate change. For today's panel discussion, we have three best personalities in the field. Honorable Mr. Justice Swatantar Kumar, former Judge Supreme Court of India, and former Chairperson, National Green Tribunal. Honorable Mr. Justice Loop, Judge Constitutional Court of Belgium, and Chair, European Union Forum of Judges for the Environment. Dr. Vivek Saxena, Country Representative, International Union for Conservation, Nature. The today's session would be moderated by Mr. Ishan Chaturvedi, Founder and Director, NVPOL, and Member, World Commission on Environmental Law, and most importantly, an alumnus of Symbiosis Law School. So I request Mr. Ishan to take the panel discussion to the next stage. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Ravanle. Uh, I would start by thanking Professor Ravanle and all our eminent panelists for giving us the time uh, to discuss such an important topic. Uh, before I delve into the meaning of the topic and introduce the topic to everyone, uh, I'd just uh, like to set the tone of this discussion. Uh, often when we're talking about global warming and climate change, there's an eerie correlation with the doom and gloom that the subject entails. And I just want to start off on a note of positivity. I just want to uh, make sure that everyone is aware of the fact that over the last three, four unfortunate months of lockdown due to the pandemic, we have seen the environment get better. We have seen climate change recede, if not completely abate itself. We have in the past seen governments plant millions of trees. We have a 16 year old, 17 year old, a uh, student who is taking the world by storm for environmental conservation. So there are enough successful highlights for us to concentrate on and not always fear climate change, but to take it head on. And uh, as regards the discussion uh, of our topic today, climate mitigation and adaptation through courts and policy, uh, we have very uh, intentively uh, used this as a topic because this assumes that climate change is a reality. It's the mitigation and adaptation that we have to work on. And having settled that, mitigation and adaptation will have to be through courts, through law and policy, and hence the current topic for today. Amidst all of this discussion, if one thinks that if we're talking about climate mitigation and adaptation, then where is climate change? Well, the change comes through courts and policy. And to substantiate on these points, we have uh, the most eminent pers personalities in global order on environment with us today. We're very lucky to have Justice Swatantra Kumar. As I mentioned, he's an institution in him, uh, himself. I, he's very famously known as the Green Judge of India because what he has done for Indian environmental law and even global environmental law with his jurisprudence over a period of time, uh, no one else has been able to replicate. And if today we're having this conversation, if people are having conversations about environmental awareness, environmental education, climate change, global warming, a major part of that in the Indian subcontinent in Asia uh, has been played by Justice Swatantra Kumar. He is obviously very well known for his industrial nature as a judge, uh, his very strong views on environmental protection and conservation, a uh, former Supreme Court judge, uh, chairperson of the National Green Tribunal, and one of the most enduring one of the most supporting, one of the most thoughtful and uh, encouraging personalities in the legal field around the globe. So we are very lucky to have Justice Swatantra Kumar with us. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us. Good 
we also have uh, Justice Luke Laverson. I'll quickly finish with the introductions and then we'll move on to our speakers. Uh, Justice Laverson himself is uh, kind of the guiding light for EU when it comes to environmental law. Right from his uh, student days, he has been delving, delving into the subject. He's also the chairperson of the EU FJE, which is the European Union for Forum of Judges on Environment. He's also a judge of the Constitution Court of Belgium. And uh, the biggest uh, and the most appealing thing about all of this is that his heart lies within environmental policy and environmental law. And it shows in all of his academic and professional pursuits over a period of time. We are very lucky to have you, sir, with us. And thank you for uh, being a part of this panel. Uh, Dr. Saxena uh, is what I call a trifecta of environmental law and policy in India. He is an officer of the Indian Forest Services from the Haryana cadre. He has worked on the ministerial level with the government and he is now heading the IUC and International Union for Con Conservation of Nature in India as a con country representative. Because of his wealth of experience in bureaucracy, government and as the lead of an international organization, we are very lucky to have him. He's also an expert in, in academically in environment. He has a PhD in climate change and agroforestry. He's also a part of a number of national and international organizations like the United Nations CCD. And he has held positions like the Deputy Inspector General of Forests and Private Secretary to the Minister of Environment and Forests in the past. So we're very lucky to have you, Dr. Saxena, and we could not be more grateful. I would not take any more of your time, uh, and I'm sure the audiences are extremely eager to hear our panelists, and I would get out of the way now, and I would uh, open the floor for Justice Kumar uh, to uh, hear his views on the current topic. Well, uh, let me first of all uh, thank uh, the Simons uh, Law School, as well as the Associated organizers for having a global webinar on such an important subject. My due regards to Justice Luke and Dr. Saxena and Dr. Vande for joining this event and the moderator, the great Mr. Sean. And uh, I would straight away come to the topic which we have to deal with, which is obviously, as you see, is the climate mitigation and adaptation through court and policy. Well, we'll have to dissect this topic a little before we can really analyze. But let's understand a very common concept of climate change. Well, what I feel personally is the greatest challenge the human race at the global level is going to face now is the climate change and more importantly the impacts and influences of climate change on our day-to-day -day life. This challenge arises out of two basic components. One, the natural process and the second is which is more important to us is the human contribution or the human degradation of environment for the purposes of bringing some radical changes in the climate. Now climate, as you know, there will be basically two serious components, one being the warming, global warming, another the climate change. These are the two basic factors which are leading to a very serious worry of today. The, in this phase, the increasing involvement of judiciary in ecological governance is the very important aspect of the present scenario. I am reminded of an example given uh, by, in the, as back as on 13th of September 19 by Matt Monrath, who had titled it as 
dirty secret gas boosts climate warming. And according to him, I needn't recite it, but what he was referring to was the sulfur hydroxide gas, which was a cheap and a horrible alternative provided for used in electric industry to prevent short circuits and accidents. The gas generated 23,500 times more warming than carbon dioxide. To put it in the right perspective, it was like one kilogram of gas warms the earth the same extent as 24 people flying London to New York and return. Now one small economic gain could do damage to the extent which I have indicated by giving you this example by Murat. It is a problem which is global. Climate change can never be a national subject. It has to be seen, it has to be dealt with globally and must be aimed at whether you act or you enact. All these two aspects must be at global level and they cannot be at national level. That's why it is rightly said that you may, today's date, as far as these two aspects are concerned, you may live nationally, but you will have to think globally if you want really what is the meaning of today's life. Now, if you will see that in the previous times, you know, I was just uh, in another webinar, Justice Michael, and uh, probably he was uh, very right in referring where he said that we are advancing towards a disaster. Now, if that be the apprehension of the judicial minds, and he referred to one of the very important concepts that was the judges as environmental managers. So if the judges have to adopt and the court system has to adopt and mold itself in a way that it must come in the process of day-to-day -day judicial determination of environment adjudication that you will have a specific bent of mind to ensure that the climate change does not or does not in any case get enhanced by virtue of undesirable human contribution, whether by violating the sustainable principle, whether by violating the precautionary principle. Once you violate these two, be sure you're inviting some serious problem. Now we will see that when, now one of the thought process if we consider was considered when the global average CO2 emissions, equitable goals were advanced or in place of equal. The concept of intergenerational equity and public trust have long been a dormant seeds seldom wrapped into a fruit bearing tree for the future that too mostly by the courts in the countries and committees like EAPCA. Just to give you an example, let's talk of Himalayans. Now Himalayans is not where India is concerned. There are eight countries which are concerned with the Himalayan range. So they have a width of 120 to 250 miles and they have a length or area of nearly 2 lakh 30,000 miles of area which they cover. And now the most serious concern out of them that arises is the glaciers. The glaciers in this entire eco-sensitive area were being reduced at a rate which was very, very kind of 
inconvenient to proper minds who could analyze the impacts of damage to the natural resources on your climate change or global warming, whatever your technology you may use, but the damage would be very immense. While dealing with this, I would definitely refer to, uh, you know, that as we just now mentioned, that there has to be an uh, ecological governance by the courts. They have to participate. So that's one of the aspects, as I said, that in the topic you have to have the court's role is one and policy is another. Policy is never the subject matter of an adjudication, but the courts would have to be creative. They will have to be inventing and advancing the environmental jurisprudence so that it does not happen that it becomes too late for other authorities to wake up and act. So judicially can be very effective and very impactful in advancing the cause of prevention of adversity of climate change and global warming. This would be squarely covered under the doctrine of expansion of jurisdiction one and judicial creativity two. Now, when I talk of these two, I certainly would very openly vouch for application of judicial activism within the framework of law. So that is one aspect we need to really care for. Now, there has been a very serious matter, and I would mention that case of, uh, uh, you know, Rotang Pass, where the glaciers were being reduced at the rate of one kilometer per year. So you can imagine what will happen in 20 years. 20 meters of glacier would be lost. What impact it would have on your climate change and consequently on your day-to-day -day life and what will be the heat generated. So you have on the one hand increased because of industrialization, increasing in the industrial progress and greenhouse gases increase. The carbon footprint is becoming a kind of a taking a back seat. So on the one hand, your industrialization and your so-called development, which is indiscriminate, is causing global warming. On the other hand, you have a climate change, which besides the natural diminishing in its values is also being aided by human interference to a large extent. Now, with this, when I mentioned there were large number of directions passed, there's a time issue here. So I can't discuss that judgment in detail, but I would request the concerned attendees and everybody to do look at that judgment because that took into consideration the economic effects, the management effects, the prevention precautionary principle effects, and very importantly, prohibitory orders for the purposes of causing restoration and regenerative of the natural resources of that area to ensure the climate change concept. Now, when we talk of policy making, the policy making is a very important facet we have in India, and of course, it is true across the globe because EIS and the controlling authorities like pollution control boards are true across the border. So therefore, you have to have a policy at both levels, that is at the regulatory level, as well as at the level of framing of policies. So the framers should be very conscious of ensuring that they are framing policies which are in consonance with the tilt towards the climate change and prevention of global warming. On the other hand, the regulators must ensure that they are effecting and regulating the policy frame in a positive manner without permitting serious damage to be done. Now, just to look at it, if you say the mitigation and adapt, uh, the adaptation circumstances, if we talk of, 
the mitigation, as it is said, is to reduce, prevent the emissions of greenhouse gases on the climate. So that is a very simple principle we have. So that's why I told you that both these concepts would be applied together. Now, when we talk of mitigation of climate change, again, we have like you should take measures with regard to substitution of uh, substitution of fossil fuels. Then you have to have uh, carbon trading. Then you must have the energy conservation. These are the three practical aspects, and that at the national levels, for example, when we talk first of to because of the impacts of the industrialization at a very rapid phase, the Kyoto Protocol, it specifically dealt with industry countries to limit and reduce the greenhouse gases. The Montreal, the Montreal Protocol also considered it, and they said that there should be ozone layer prevent protection and out of production onerous substances, those substances which will generate greenhouse gases would be specified and controlled. So this continued with a effective manner in the Paris Agreement, then again in the 2019 Climate Action Subway, and then this is the international protocols, treaties, and conventions which have emphasized the need for protecting our climate. And basically, if you see the climate change and the global warming, both are incidental to our environment of natural resources. So we have to basically protect our natural resources, whether this water, whether it is forests, whether it is our uh, you know, eco-sensitive range of mountains, whether it is air. So you have to ultimately bring out to a clean environment in order to ensure that there is least damage done to all this. Now, the role of courts is more often than not referred with a kind of a little criticism. You know, they, the people, the authorities find it very difficult that they think that authorities are the whole soul mindset of correct environmental creativity. They think that protection is their prerogative and nobody else can touch it. But let's not forget it. If we live it, I think, I'm sure uh, Brother Luke would be able to throw light on what he has contributed, his country has contributed towards this across Brazil, I can talk about, UK I can talk about, I can talk about US, how much effective, for example, the Hawaii Supreme Court is so effective on climate change cases. There are very few, but what is required in the effective manner today is that the courts should not. And now, if we look from the environmental jurisprudence growth in India, it has been fabulous. You know, it has been one of the best progressive environmental jurisprudence in this country by the Supreme Court of India, by the National Green Tribunal, by the high courts. You know, they have really touched very sensitive subjects and have always ensured that the people do not misuse their power and they should not be permitted to range impact their economic benefits just to disadvantage of our day-to-day -day life. The impacts of climate change we are seeing today. Um, for example, it is the studies show that it is going to be one of the most serious impacts on India would be on agriculture. And India being an agricultural country, it has to be very cautious about impacts of climate change because there are, you know, the agriculture land is reducing by the day. And if the crops are going to be adversely impacted by virtue of climate change, then probably the agriculture activity would definitely affect even our economic growth. We have to analyze and let's be very clear about that there have been definite cases in India 
with regard to climate change cases, you know, whether they're related to glaciers, whether they're related to forests, whether they're related to general contribution of our day-to-day -to -day life towards, for example, if you burn a waste, it's a direct impact on climate. And so it is it's not that, you know, you should deal waste only as a municipal solid waste affair and with no consequences, certainly not. In my humble opinion, it's a matter which has a direct consequence and adverse impact on environment and therefore on your climate change contributor. It becomes a very, it generates carbon, it generates other matters. It is supposed to be cancerous, you know, burning of waste and plastic, which is very serious. So therefore, one simple thing which you correct can be very positive for climate change. And if you don't, it can be very adverse for climate change and therefore can disturb your lives. The policy framers have to be very conscious and therefore they should be the people who are trained, who are interested academically, and they must have appropriate data before they formulate policy for the purposes of preventing any damage to the climate and climate change. Climate change, as partly I said, is inevitable. You can't just expect always just one climate all through for generations. But various countries have contributed in their own way. And there has been a reference to various cases. For example, uh, in the case of this uh, post of uh, Rika, it's a very important judgment on climate change and where they went to the extent of that even direct damage is not only the consideration, indirect damage itself can be considered under the climate change cases. Then you had the Ethiopian uh, government which recently directed 350 million trees to be grown. So that is the contribution which is required, that is the consciousness required and that is why I think the Indian judiciary contributed a lot, particularly expanding the scope of Article 21 to the extent that even water was clean, water was stated to be a right, fundamental right. So if that is the approach we have to take, naturally you can't get clean air, clean water until you let your climate be what it should be. The climate change is a question today which requires, and I would conclude by saying that it climate change is a big question mark today, not for India, not for our surrounding countries, but for the entire global family. We need to answer this question in the affirmative all the time and protect what can be a disaster for the humanity in the coming times. And I thank all of you. Thank you so much, Justice Kumar. It's always a pleasure to hear you speak. And I think some of the issues that you touched upon, uh, starting with the BBC article to the global importance of climate change and how it's not a national issue, but an international issue. Uh, the importance of creativity of judges, the importance of activism, how you yourself as uh, one of the premier judges of the Supreme Court of India and as the chairperson of National Green Tribunal have sort of led the way in giving the desired importance to climate change and how every country and human population should come together and, and go by the laurels of Article 21, giving the right to clean and decent environment to uh, every citizen. So thank you so much, Justice Kumar, for your talk. Uh, just just for, a, for our participants, I'd like to mention, Justice Kumar referred to the Rotang Pass judgment. The name of the judgment, uh, as he rightly pointed out, is Dur Durga Dutt Sharma versus State of Himachal Pradesh, in case anyone wants to look it up. Uh, we'll quickly move on to Justice Lavison, and uh, we have been uh, waiting for his talk for, for uh, ever since he uh, gave us the time. And, and uh, over to you, uh, Your Lordship. Oh, thank you. So I have uh, made a short uh, presentation, and uh, the topic I would like to speak about is climate change law in the European Union and its member states and unfortunately also in its ex 
member states uh, when we talk uh, about uh, the united the united uh, kingdom uh, and now i have to see how it's yeah it's going like that so climate change is of course a global uh, problem and uh, as you know with the paris agreement of december 2015 which is in force uh, since the 4th of November uh, 2016, the world community has taken important engagements in terms of uh, uh, reduction of emissions, in terms of transparency and global stock taking, in terms of adaptation, and also in support of climate action for uh, developing countries. Uh, I think you are familiar with this uh, commitment, so I will not go into the details now. But what is more important, that's not only the commitment, but what is happening in reality. And for that I have to refer to the so-called Emission Gap Report of 2019 of UNEP, the United Nations Environmental uh, Programme. And uh, I will list for you the main conclusions uh, of that, uh, I think, very important report. First conclusion is greenhouse gas uh, emissions continue to rise despite scientific warnings and political commitments. And here you see the, uh, the different uh, countries uh, on the graph, including uh, India. Uh, second, uh, the G20 members account for 78% of those emissions and collectively they are on track to meet their 2020 pledges, but these are limited. But seven countries are currently not on track to meet the uh, commitments they have made, the so-called national determined contributions. And for a further three, it's unclear if they are on track or not. Happily for us, the European Union 28 uh, member states and India are believed to be on track for the 2020 commitments. Only a few countries have so far formally submitted long-term strategies to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. But more and more countries are, however, announcing that they will strive at a net zero emission target for 2050, so that there are not more emissions than uh, the, uh, the, the sinks uh, which are available. But there is a large emission gap. In 2020, annual emissions need to be 15 gigaton the carbon dioxide equivalent lower than the current national determined, uh, 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 national determined commitments imply for the two degree uh, object Celsius objective. And even it should be 32 gigaton lower for the, the goal we, we are striving at, that's the 1.5 uh, degree Celsius goal. If current commitments, uh, national determined contributions are fully implemented, according to this report, we are going for an increase of the global temperature uh, of 3.2 degrees Celsius at the end of this century. And for the for consequences of this, we can refer to another important report of the IPP, IPCC, the special report on global uh, warming of last year uh, also. So next message, uh, we need to strengthen in a dramatic way the NDCs this year to go for the objectives for 2030, 40 and 50. So enhanced action by uh, the members of the G20 will be essential for uh, the global mitigation uh, effort. Uh, and now the global mean temperature last year was already estimated to be 1.28 uh, 
uh, degrees Celsius above the average temperature of the late 19th century. And we can see every day the effects. It's not any more uh, future. Uh, this the effects, uh, we can see it in terms of droughts and heat waves, hurricanes, floodings, fires. It's every day uh, in uh, different parts uh, of uh, the world. Let's look now to the European Union. What are the policies uh, for the moment? For 2020, we have the so-called 2020 program. This means the European Union likes to reduce its emissions with 20% compared with 1990 uh, towards the end of this year. And on that, the European Union is on track. Uh, so for the moment, when things, the, the reduction will be a little bit uh, higher, 23%. One likes to increase energy efficiency with 20%. And we uh, like to increase the share of renewable energy till 20% at the end of this year. Next stage, 2030. For the moment, the commitments uh, written in law are to reduce the emissions with at least 40% compared with 1990. And this uh, has to be uh, divided in uh, three main uh, sub-objectives. The first one is the objective for the so-called ETS sectors, so that is the emission trading system, so uh, uh, the sources which are covered by that mechanism. So that is the objective to reduce with 43% uh, compared with 2005. Then the other sectors, uh, the non-ETS sectors as they are called, they are regulated by the uh, so-called effort sharing decision. This means that uh, action must be taken by the member states uh, itself. And together for those sectors, the, uh, the idea is to reduce emissions with 30%. And for each member states of the European Union, there is a specific objective. And this objective must be implemented through so-called uh, integrated national energy and climate uh, plans, which must be reviewed periodically. And also the European Commission will look if member states are on track with implementing those uh, uh, programs. And last is the land use and forestry regulation for 2021 and 2030. So there, the accounted uh, emissions from land use uh, are, must be entirely compensated by an equivalent removal of carbon uh, di dioxide from the atmosphere through action in the same sector. That is what we call the no debit rule. The share of renewable energy uh, must go up to at least 32% and energy uh, efficiency should be increased to uh, with 32.5%. Uh, uh, so that are the objectives which has been set uh, some years uh, ago. Last year, after the uh, elections for the European Parliament, we got also a new European Commission, and this is let's say, the daily government uh, of the European uh, Union, with, uh, which is led now by Ursula von der Leyen. And that commission came up, uh, uh, I must say, with a very ambitious program, which is called the European Green Deal. And the idea is to increase the ambitions uh, of the European Union. So for uh, emission reductions, instead of 40% for 2030, which is now uh, committed to, the European Commission is proposing to go for reductions going to 50 to 55% uh, compared always with 1990. And on the long term, 2050, uh, the aim is to get, uh, to have net or zero greenhouse gas uh, emissions uh, uh, within the European uh, Union. How uh, will the European Commission try to 
uh, to have an agreement on those uh, objectives. This is through a European Union climate law. And the European Commission has tabled a draft of such a law. And what can you find in that draft? It said the long-term direction for meeting this 2050 climate neutrality objective uh, through all policies, so in an integrated way, and it should be in a socially fair and cost efficient manner. That's the basic uh, idea. Uh, one tries also to create a system for monitoring the progress and for taking further actions if that is needed. The aim is also to provide predictability for investors and other economic actors and ensure that the transition to climate neutrality is irreversible. So this uh, Green Deal uh, is composed of lots uh, of different uh, uh, actions and one main objective uh, is of course uh, this climate neutrality towards 2000. Uh, 50. So now this is a proposal of uh, the new European uh, Commission, but the European Commission as such has no uh, power to decide uh, on uh, those uh, objectives. It's uh, the European Parliament together with the Council, and the Council are the member uh, states, uh, they are the, the lawmakers, so they have to uh, decide uh, on this uh, proposal. So where are we now? The European Parliament will very likely back the project uh, and is even uh, proposing uh, in some respects uh, going uh, a little bit further, uh, uh, further with the objectives. But of course, the main a uh, player is the council, uh, where the member states uh, have, uh, uh, are gathering. And so the member states, the 27 uh, for the moment, uh, must uh, agree uh, with that because uh, this climate, uh, the climate law uh, must be uh, uh, adopted by unanimity by the uh, member states. I must say not all member states are, uh, are enthusiastic uh, with the proposal. Some of them uh, are of the opinion that this program is uh, much uh, too much ambitious and that uh, probably economic and social consequences will be uh, high. And regrettably, I have to, to say that also uh, my country is not 100% uh, uh, enthusiastic uh, about uh, the, the, the level of ambition. So the European uh, Commission has proposed what is called a Just Transition Fund that will support the economies of member states which can be uh, impacted by the measures to help to uh, agree uh, on uh, on the proposal and to help the member states to finance uh, this transition towards a circular and a green uh, economy. And another important question is of course, uh, what will bring, what will be the, the consequences of the economic financial crisis due to, to the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, so it was already mentioned, uh, Certainly in the beginning uh, of uh, the lockdowns, we have seen that the environment was uh, uh, reviving, uh, etc. But on the other hand, we see that uh, the budgets uh, of the states are under pressures and also the budgets of companies are under pressures. So it still has to be seen uh, if, uh, there will be enough, uh, let's say, money to 
to invest uh, in this uh, economic uh, uh, transition. And so the support of the member states is uh, uh, crucial and also the implementation because of course if you have a European law on paper that's just uh, the first phase then the question of uh, implementation uh, comes and I think an interesting development we see in some of the member uh, states is that they have introduced a national climate change laws uh, of a general uh, nature and the first one was the UK in 2008 but meanwhile uh, followed uh, with variations by uh, different other uh, member states. The last one uh, last year was the Netherlands um, also under the influence of the Urgenda agenda case court case uh, which was already uh, mentioned and the very last last one is uh, germany also here uh, in my country last year there was a proposal for such a climate law but it has not been uh, passed yet so also there some additional uh, action should be is uh, needed so i think such national climate change laws can contribute to the implementation of global European and national uh, policies and I think a very important feature of these different national laws is that they provide an independent committee composed uh, of uh, experts uh, on climate uh, economics and so on which oversees government uh, actions, which will, uh, let's say, assess uh, government policy, which will report uh, on it. Are we on track? Should we do more? And uh, they are reporting both to uh, the parliament, uh, both to the uh, different stakeholders and also the general the general uh, public and I think that's a very important uh, feature to have that you have independent uh, review uh, of uh, governmental uh, policies and also of course parliamentary control and these uh, reports of these uh, independent committees are helping of course members of parliament to uh, uh, do their job uh, in controlling uh, the uh, government and last point of course is the very importance of access to justice that uh, on the basis of those uh, acts that uh, the people who are concerned can go to court if uh, the uh, obligations the legal obligations uh, international european or on the national level are not uh, executed properly by uh, the government and that uh, judicial review is uh, possible and that the judiciary has sufficient remedies to use in cases when the government uh, is uh, not uh, uh, functioning uh, well and my expectation is uh, uh, Justice Kumar has uh, already mentioned some important uh, climate change cases all over uh, the world that we are just in the beginning uh, of that and that we will see more much more uh, of uh, those cases coming in uh, different parts uh, of the world including uh, I think uh, in uh, Europe uh, in the coming period because we have and uh, I think the, the actual pandemic is just a small crisis compared with uh, the climate uh, crisis uh, we are facing. So I think uh, for the judiciary, for the, the legal profession, there is a lot of work uh, in the years to come to help to fight uh, this uh, much more dangerous virus 
I think than uh, the uh, corona uh, virus we are facing this day. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, thank you so much, Justice Laprison. Uh, again, we are extremely blessed to have uh, such a such a well uh, informed and experienced panel because uh, what Justice Laprison covered in fifteen minutes of his talk is basically everything to do uh, with climate change in today's world. So he's talked about internal dynamics. He's talked about ambitious goals. He's also talked about the financial crisis and its in its dictum in playing the larger role towards climate adaptation and mitigation. And ultimately, on a very positive note, he's kind of clarified that he's still hopeful that the uh, judiciary around the globe, as Justice Kumar so poignantly put, uh, is just beginning. And it's in its, in its first strides towards achieving more activism, more climate uh, adaptation, uh, creativity in its decision making. And uh, with this optimistic thought, I'd like to move uh, on to uh, Dr. Vivek Saxena. Before I do, though, I just want to uh, let our participants know that uh, we will, after Dr. Saxena's talk, we'll be going on to live uh, questions and answers. So all of those uh, who have questions, kindly raise your hands, enter the queue, and we'll take up the questions uh, after Dr. Saxena's talk. Uh, Dr. Saxena, thank you for uh, uh, for waiting for your talk and and I'm sure for all of us it's absolutely worth the wait when we listen to you. So over to you, sir. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Ishan. And first uh, of all, let me thank uh, organizers, Symbiosis University, Chandigarh University, uh, Ishan, and especially Professor Chanshekar for organizing this webinar uh, on a very, very important thematic area and giving all me an opportunity to share the panel with such an eminent uh, jurist, uh, Honorable Justice Swatan Kumarji and Honorable Justice Luk. And we have already listened during their talk that with their vast experience, uh, what they have contribution and the contribution for ecological governance and uh, other issues in the day to day, how to discipline uh, the various sectors uh, through the various Im implementation of various directions the policy regulations, and that has certainly addressed the environmental issues, especially in India, in a very, very effective uh, manner in the past. And uh, with Justice Uttar Kumar, sir, I have witnessed right from the beginning uh, when the NGT was constituted and the NGT has grown to such an height that uh, entire our ecological governance now in various sectors, maybe the government, maybe the policy makers, maybe the business people, they all have now started understanding that they have to integrate sustainability and environmental concerns into their practices. And especially also, we listened to Justice Look, who shared the European Union experience. Now, taking it further, uh, let me share my screen. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir, very much. Okay. So uh, just what is the role of basically international organizations? So presently, uh, I am working as a country representative of International Union for Conservation of Nature, which at the global level is playing a very significant role for the nature conservation, which ultimately addresses the mitigation as well as adaptation challenges. So before proceeding further, let me just briefly introduce about the IUCN. IUCN is the world's oldest environmental organization, which was set up in 1948, uh, just after the World War, that time when people hardly used to talk about the environment. And it is the professional conservation network having more than 1,200 member organizations in 160 countries, more than now presently 15,000 voluntary scientists and experts who are members of the IUCN commissions. So IUCN work is organized into the six commissions Red List Commission, the IUCN Commission on Environmental Law. So it is a, some sort of a neutral forum for the governments, NGOs, scientists, business, and local communities. And it is a unique hybrid organization because when we talk of uh, uh, different conventions, the climate change convention or biodiversity convention, in which the national governments, they are the parties to the convention. But in case of the IUCN, we have representation of the national governments also as a state member. We have a civil society organizations also. We have a specialized institutional members also. 
and one of the flagship knowledge product apart from uh, other many product is the iucn red list so once iucn red list process in which we assess the species and, and categorize them as endangered vulnerable or various type of categories because of the various type of human impacts or maybe uh, ecosystem related disruption and that species if their population is declining or if their habitat is degrading and then when we categorize it into some particular category then triggers the conservation action and it ultimately helps various type of uh, objectives which we know in the present day parlance when we talk of the climate change issues the mitigation and adaptation and another significant role of iucn iucn has got the official observer status at the united nations general assembly because in united nations general assembly nations speak of their respective national interest but the voice of the environment and the voice of the species it does not recognize any geographical boundaries so that's why the iucn plays a very significant role in shaping the global conservation agenda in a journey of more than 70 years iucn has played a very significant contribution through the shaping up of the world conservation strategy coming up of the three rio conventions including the climate change convention biodiversity convention now in the post 2020 global biodiversity framework and different type of climate change negotiations iucn is playing a very significant role and ultimately when we look for the various type of environment related challenges the nature based solutions they are the key for any type of uh, you can say interventions and we have to look back to the nature to find the solutions and in the upcoming world conservation congress which will be held in january in marseille france the nature based solutions standards will be launched now coming further what type of problem we are facing when we are talking of the climate change mitigation and adaptation if we see on the left side of the screen we have a countries by the population size and on the right hand side we have a you can say global economy of 80 trillion dollar and this population pressure that with the economy linked with it it has created various type of increased anthropogenic or human footprint which has caused various type of increase in emissions disruption in the ecosystems reduction in the ecosystem services and that's why we are talking today how to ensure this and the next picture just if you see what are the problem human population the cattle the various type of emissions the stubble burning the degradation of the forest waste disposal you see we degrade the land land degradation where industrial emissions so we need to discipline ourselves in all these aspects if we really want to uh, make this planet earth livable and sustainable for the future generations because on the planet earth we have a number of species and human being is one of the species for our survival we need nature and nature is already number a large number of species so we have to ensure when whatever development pathway we choose we have to be it should be in symbiotic relationship with the, all the species because all the species globally have a equal right and taking it further we have various type of ecosystems which provides us various type of care to us and it ecosystem services they provide they at itself takes care of how in which species has to be located in which geographic region and nature has itself decided such providing various type of climates for uh, best survival of those species for purification of the water the coastal areas the marine species the fisheries carbon sequestration and mangrove coral reef and all this so nature has itself provided various type of solutions and we have to respect the design of the nature when we talk of the ecological governance the governance should look back to the nature and find the solution so these are the various type of now present day challenges when we are talking if, of the taking care of the all the humanity all the global population climate change food security water security human health uh, socio economic development disaster risk reduction and ecosystem degradation and biodiversity loss in the present day context when we are facing the covid pandemic the human health has become one of the biggest factor and one of the causes for this present uh, pandemic is somehow rooted into the, the disruption of the ecosystems 
and this disconnect with the nature. So coming to the next, what role basically the courts and judiciary can play in ensuring that we get our right to live in a safe and a cleaner environment and that is the right to life. So if we see, we have number of sustainable development goals. We have to have harmonious relationship between the biosphere which nature has provided, the society which consists of all the population in the different geographic regions and the economy for our further progress, the various type of development pathways we choose and develop the economy. And these linkages between these three and also in the relation to the sustainable development goals when we talk about 17 sustainable development goals and 169 targets to address all these issues and challenges. If we see already we have at the policy level government when we talk of the ecological governance, we have Environment Protection Act, Forest Protection Act, CAMPA regulation, uh, which was ultimately, and it was at the intervention of uh, Honorable Supreme Court. And it was a very historical because initiative to ensure that whatever forest we, for the development we lose, we have to ensure how to regenerate, how to replant. The waste management, the compliance of the waste management rules, Central Pollution Control Board and State Pollution Control Board, and many other administrative mechanism, state forest departments and others. At the international level, we have number of conventions and the protocols ranging from the climate change convention, biodiversity, desertification, convention on the migratory species, the convention on the illegal trade on endangered species, nationally determined contributions under the Paris Climate Change Agreement, and IG biodiversity targets and sustainable development goals. So, the role of judiciary in India especially has been very, very significant and effective and has played a very significant role in disciplining all the relevant stakeholders and ensuring the compliance. But at the same time, when we talk of uh, various types of compliances, we have to have integration of the ecological eth ethics within ourselves. So that's why we have to ensure that we don't degrade the environment further. And some of the historical principles for the uh, environmental and ecological governance, which have been reiterated already, uh, uh, and they are the basic core of the, all the environmental jurisprudence also, the precautionary principle, the polluter pace principle, the right to life through various judgments in the public trust doctrine. The number of judgments have been based on these principles. Now, let me come to the, what the role IUCN plays in uh, supporting the environmental law. IUCN World Environment, uh, Commission on Environmental Law is a network of environmental law and policy experts from all regions of the world who volunteer their knowledge and services to IUCN activities, especially those of the IUCN Environmental Law Program. It has more than 1,400 members worldwide that include judges, prosecutors, government attorneys, private attorneys, law professors, and all others which are engaged in the commission's work and mission. The commission members represent every region of the world and their interest and expertise, they spend the full spectrum of environmental law from pollution issues to those related to the biodiversity conservation. Now, taking it further, IUCN organized the first IUCN World Environmental Law Congress in April 2016 in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And that declaration was based on the, it outlined the 13 principles for developing and implementing solutions for the ecologically sustainable development. So these 13 principles, their obligation to protect nature, right to nature and rights of nature, right to environment, ecological sustainability and resilience, in dubio pro natura, when in doubt in favor of nature. So whenever we talk of anything and we have any doubt to find the solution, we have to look and the nature has to be given precedence over every other thing if we have to follow this environmental rule of law and follow the future pathway for a sustainable environment for us. Ecological functions, intragenerational and intergenerational equity, gender equality, participation of minority and vulnerable groups, indigenous and tribal peoples, non-regression progression. So these are the 13 principles uh, which were uh, part of the declaration during the first uh, uh, Congress on Environmental Law. And IUCN 
has, has a, also organized when we talk of the climate change, climate change specialist group, which aims at providing policy and legal input to the IUCN and its members with respect to legal issues involving climate change and its adverse impacts. The global network of lawyers, practitioners, and professionals on cross -cutting, from cross-cutting disciplines, they are part of this specialist group. And some of the important projects which this specialist group have undertaken, they are related to the climate change mitigation and land use, getting to zero study on the policy options, legal issues in implement of the implementation of the Paris Agreement, fighting climate change, a best practice guide for judges and court, and the transition of the energy system. Apart from this, to assist on various aspects of environmental law, IUCN has developed two tools. One is CLIMA. CLIMA is a guide to strengthening governance arrangements for mainstreaming and scaling up ecosystem adaptation. And it is built on 16 governance principles for ecosystem-based adaptation developed by the IUCN Environmental Law Center. And these principles have been grouped into five large, uh, larger blocks to ease their understanding and use. These five blocks uh, are flexibility, multidimensional coordination, ecosystem approach, public participation, and equity, capacities, funding, and the rule of law. Another very important tool which IUCN has developed, that is Ecolex. It is a gateway to environmental law. Ecolex has been designed to be most comprehensive global source of information on national and international environmental law. Entire spectrum of environmental subjects it covers, maybe from the marine area to the climate change, energy, land, soil, species, forestry, waste, food, agriculture, etc. Now, coming back to the uh, role of courts and judiciary uh, in India, especially, and it, also the lawmakers, uh, it will be <laughs> too much for me because already in the presence of Justice Sotan Kumarji, and uh, but I will very uh, touch these issues away in very little. Some of the historical milestone uh, related to the ecological or environmental governance in India, our 42nd Amendment uh, of the Constitution of India, adding Article 48A and 51AG, the right to life, various judicial pronouncements, the famous Godavarman case, which has shaped the further uh, regulation of the forest diversion issues and also generation of the uh, resources, financial resources for restoration of the forest, forest landscape restoration through the CAMPA fund. Then various type of judgments in relation to the oleum gas leak case and the landmark case on the environmental law which was based on the public trust doctrine, MC Mehta versus Kamal Nath. A number of such ju judgments I have witnessed, uh, Justice Sutan Kumarji, and uh, I have also attended uh, uh, as an official uh, in his court and uh, I have really learned a lot uh, during the court proceedings and the with the passionate way in which uh, uh, Justice Sutan Kumar sir has given those pronouncements and that is really there they are the really eye openers for every section of the society how we should take care of the environment our, ourselves and now when we talk of the uh, ple uh, pleasant surprises during the COVID-19 crisis this gives us a, some sort of a baseline or eye opener that what should be the our surroundings. We wit suddenly we were witnessing the rivers are clean, cleaner air, new shades of green, blue, blue sky in the Delhi city. Children are witnessing twinkling of the star. Snow-clad mountains are visible from the distant cities. Peacocks, birds chirping, and increasing visibility of all forms of wildlife even in the city. They are the pleasant surprises. I think this is the surrounding environment that should be the aim, and the business models or all the activities, they should take ensure that whatever way they develop their business models, we have to aim that we have to provide society, the surrounding cleaner air, the cleaner water, cleaner sources of drinking water, the cleaner sky, and no very little pollution and very reduced impact on the environment. Because ultimately, if we have disconnect with the nature, we don't care for the nature, such type of pandemic threat will always be there and rather than having growth model, which looking for the growth and profit in the business models, if suddenly such type of event occurs, then entire world become, uh, comes at the halt and all the business cycles change, they have disrupted. So business models, when they are, will be focusing on the revival, renewal and reconstruction, they have to reintrospect and redefine their role in valuing, restoring and protecting the 
natural world on which we all define, depend. They have to be self-compliant and if redefined business practices need to be integrated. They should pledge for the zero pollution of the water resources, amb ambient air, efficient waste recycling, land degradation neutrality, biodiversity conservation, adhering to the strictest environmental standards and integration of the ecological ethics and morality in the business practices. And this will be key for meeting the mitigation as well as adaptation targets. So what we need to relook when we are talking of, uh, at the same time, the role of judiciary and courts in ensuring adaptation and mitigation. But at the same time, if we ourselves become ecologically disciplined, then we have to look the, we, in what way we want to develop our cities. This is the lesson, what way we grow our food. With the less of chemicals, we have to go for the more and more organic thing. We have to ensure that we don't degrade our land. Uh, our land. Uh, soil health is a very important factor. The way we develop our business, the way we respect and value nature, the way we conserve species, the way we degrade natural resources, the way we our, our consumption is, and the way we recycle our waste. Overall, the way we inhabit and care for the planet Earth. So we need to pledge that if I am not polluting, I will not degrade nature. I will love wildlife. I will not allow others to harm nature. And who has to pledge? All the policymakers, the, all the governance framework for the ecological governance, all the businesses, all the communities, all the stakeholders, in all the geographies. And we presently, when we are seeing planet Earth is under repair, though under the Paris Climate Change Agreement, we have submitted national NDC targets and uh, just to slope just mentioned that even if we, we meet our all the NDC commitments, we are going to have increase in the temperature of uh, 3.2 degrees centigrade. So now if we don't do uh, take care of the nature, we don't integrate ecological ethics ourselves, the nature will itself settle the things. And accordingly now when we are seeing itself that surrounding air and all uh, environment has become cleaner, so their nature has its own way to correct the things. So rather than by waiting for nature to take care and correct the things, we should ourselves take care and we should at least preserve what is left of nature. With these words, I thank you once again uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity for sharing my views uh, for today's webinar. And again, on behalf of the IUCN also, I thank uh, uh, organizers, uh, also, Honorable Justice Sutan Kumarji, Honorable Justice Luk, Professor Chandshekar, and everyone. And ultimate solution is that nature has to be told in a very, very simple definition. So we should not make the definition of the environment or uh, very, very complicated. So it has to be adopted by each and everyone that at the local level in our surroundings, we have to ensure that our uh, we have the minimum footprint so that the nature is not degraded. We take care for the nature. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Saxena. Uh, again, some of the points that you mentioned, especially 13 principles of environmental rule of law uh, is extremely beneficial and, and it was put in such an uncomplicated way uh, that your final statement about uncomplicating environment has been personified by your own good self. Uh, we will be taking live questions now, so I'd be happy to uh, consider any raised hands that, that have been raised in the meanwhile. I'd also quickly let our participants know that it was my fault that I mentioned at the beginning that Dr. Saxena is the trifecta of bureaucracy, government, and intergovernmental organization. For those of you who are wondering why he is so well-versed with the law, he's also a qualified lawyer. So just so all of you know, he is actually a quadrifecta of, of uh, all things environment rolled into one. And it is our pleasure to have you with us, Dr. Saxena, and thank you so much for, for your insightful talk. Uh, as, an, oh, as we will move on to audio questions and raised hands, uh, we have got a multitude of very interesting questions, and I'm, I'm almost proud of the kind of questions that we've got. So uh, I'd start with Justice Kumar. One of the very interesting questions that has come up, sir, is about how in countries like India, especially, where judiciary is already doing so much, and your good self has been at the helm of environmental judiciary for, for quite some time, uh, there is still a laxity in terms of execution 
and monitoring and and is there a certain way where this could be fixed in the long term how the executive branch the legislature and the judiciary all of them could work together one because as of now there seems to be too much burden on the judiciary and secondly what according to you uh, this is from all the young lawyers around the globe what according to you makes a good environmental lawyer the questions have been asked by mrs charu sharma and uh, an anonymous question is there so you're on mute sir it will be in the bottom yeah, left yeah. now see what i uh, feel is that uh, i will answer the later part of the question first and then go to the earlier part of the question see to be a good environmental lawyer i think all you need is a good heart you know and which does have a brain which thinks a feeling of fairness to environment once you have these two elements and you work hard i don't see a reason that why you can't be a good environmental lawyer and let me tell you to be on the right side of the track lawyer environmental lawyers are making good money all over the globe today so that should be an incentive for you the second thing is that yes there is execution of uh, judicially with regard to different orders has been an issue across the globe it's not very particular in india it's all over the world because the orders that are passed by the regulating authorities or by the courts are not easy to carry out so they can carry economic burden on the industry or on the person so there is a catch up but yes the best way out is as i said in my talk also the policy framers should be field oriented they should know what is happening on the field so that the restrictions they impose are not impractical there should be total update on technology applicable and a technology which is least harmful to the nature thirdly there has to be a collective and conscious effort not only of the legislator judiciary and the regulatory authorities but most importantly of the people at large unless and until the public at large would become conscious of environment protection nothing can be done you know when people want to do it now you see covid 19 now people wanted to do it you don't see people on the road you are working from home you are holding webinars on this like this so this is all is a creation of the human mind so we need a collective concerted effort and i'm sure we can do good thank you so much sir uh, absolutely on point i think uh, that covers both the questions quite holistically and in detail uh, i'd move on to uh, justice loop there's a very interesting question uh, that has come from uh, charvi kumar and it's on paris agreement and and uh, she is saying that uh, it is understood that the paris agreement has very ambitious goals and it is still an effort in process where every country can come together and contribute towards the goals of the paris agreement but eventually the question is is the paris agreement still enough or are there other factors that will need to be taken under way to actually give a shape to the concept of climate adaptation and climate mitigation i think it's a, a difficult question to 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 answer the first answer could be the paris agreement is a sort of turning system in that in that sense that in the paris agreement you have the two main uh, uh, objectives but there is also a sort of mechanism for periodical review in the right sense eh? because it's not written like that but uh, the principle of uh, it's not a principle of non regression is the principle of progression which is written down in uh, in the paris uh, uh, agreement so i think it was uh, probably the best possible agreement that could be reached in 2015 but it's only a starting point 
Yeah, it's a mechanism. So uh, now, for the first time, these national determined contributions have to be reviewed and have to reviewed looking to the the gap report uh, I mentioned should be reviewed in a more ambitious way. And this is a mechanism that uh, the, the different uh, member states, the different parties to the, the agreement are looking to each other. It's a sort of peer review uh, 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 process. So the answer is, uh, is it an off? Yes and no. Uh, yes, it could be uh, enough. Uh, no, it's not enough if it's it's only the text uh, uh, and uh, if the the implementation and the follow up is 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 not following. Uh, that's the first thing. And the second thing, uh, I think it's very important that uh, we take climate change not as a separate subject, but it's combined with the issue of biodiversity. So uh, I think the loss of biodiversity uh, on the one hand uh, is one of the causes of, of, of climate change, but uh, uh, also nature and nature-based solutions can also help. So, so there was already, uh, I think by Justice Komar uh, and also by uh, Dr. Saxena uh, a reference to the, the, the huge uh, plantation project in Ethiopia. So uh, we, we have to, to, to uh, so uh, if you, you, you see what's uh, deforestation, what is going, going on, this is just the wrong thing to do. So we have to reverse uh, uh, this, we have to, to, to plant uh, trees. Uh, uh, so I mentioned that we have a regulation in Europe uh, that uh, there would be any loss anymore uh, of uh, forest cover. Today, uh, in the newspaper, there are reports uh, about satellite uh, survey in Europe that we are losing uh, forest. So that so we have to to work on uh, at, on those two tracks together. I think, and the one can reinforce uh, the other. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Justice Luke. Uh, I think uh, you're absolutely right. Just the fact that it's a first step in the right direction is an achievement in itself. But because of the dynamism and uh, the ever-changing models of climate change, we have to be very flexible as we decide on our future goals going forward. Uh, Dr. Saxena, I'll come, for, come to you uh, before we take on the next uh, audio question because this one is right up your alley and, and it, it, it is something that you've worked on for a long time. Uh, the question is in relation to, it has two aspects. So one is the intersectionality of climate change itself. As you mentioned, there's food security, there's water issues, there's now there's this advent of you know, gender justice, community justice, equity, equality. Uh, so what are your views on such a diverse problem and having solutions to such diverse problems can be very tricky instead of going to you know a, a particular issue issue wise instead of you know global issue and the second thing is that when we include these community issues you you include air issues water issues biodiversity forest issues do you think that that somehow complicates the whole idea of achieving a solution of climate change when you start scampering to various issues instead of addressing the main issue at hand. Yeah. This question is by Mr. Madhukar Sharma, by the way. Congratulations, Madhukar. It's a very good question. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, really very good question. And the basic answer we start with when we I started that we should take care of the nature and look to the nature for the solutions. And what nature has provided, nature has provided equal right to everyone. So accordingly, when we talk, take care of the community, or maybe talk of the gender, maybe for your emission, you don't have a right to degrade your surrounding environment because nature has provided you enough environment to survive. And this over very much environment 
if you are degrading then you are at fault and when you are talking of the solution when you may be the involving the community you have to take your care of the community because the approach if we see that we talk of the environment but we say ki, okay our surrounding environment is good but not in my backyard so if out your side your backyard you are throwing your waste and not thinking about that how it is being further finding the end uh, result and where it is finally getting disposed whether it is degrading land it is polluting the water resources similarly when we talk of the circular economy the business practices they are producing a particular product but it goes from the various you can say business uh, chain and in that process if it is degrading the nature it is polluting it is creating in the process it is emissions are there and you are not taking care of uh, discharge of the effluents so all this what type of chemicals you use so these 13 principles which i mentioned as per the iucn first world conservation congress and in totality they take care of all those things and if we take care of these things because development also has to go but at the same time as honorable justice sudan kumar ji also told that technology also the clean technology because then again comes a issue between the developed world and developing world because developing world we also have a right to develop further in the name of having the carbon space and like that the poor people they can't be denied their right to, to develop further so how to ensure a balance we have to also provide technology the clean technology the required finance and the correct planning right intervention at the global level when we talk of all these conventions like ndc targets or paris agreement the thing is we have all in to agreement the main issue is how to implement it in and ensure its implementation at the grassroots level because all the solutions lie at the grassroots level and again that's why this is look also reiterated that nature based solutions we have to look for there and if we have any doubt <clears throat> for any of the thing the nature has to be given favor so i think that answers the question because question had covered a number of aspects of all those issues so gender community <clears throat> technology uh, climate change mitigation adaptation they all can be i think summarized if we take care of the nature and we need to be serious sincere in all our initiatives and everyone has to uh, maybe the government maybe the business maybe the local community maybe the rural community community only from through our <clears throat> education process we need to sensitize them we need to make them aware we have to provide right environment livable conditions for everyone with good clean sources of water good land ensuring soil health these are the key for meeting the targets maybe the ndc targets climate change agreement adaptation mitigation in whatever uh, terminology we speak Uh, thank you so much dr saxena and given the fact that it was a very complicated question i must congratulate you for having covered all the bases of the answer that could possibly be and and just the whole idea that uh, climate change in its essence is like a rubik's cube with different sides and just because you get one side of the same color or one side right does not mean that you've solved the whole cube as a problem so uh, taking a cue from that we shall uh, i must also apologize to our esteemed panelists because uh, we getting very greedy to have all of this knowledge on our panel and we have kind of gone over the allotted time we'll just take one last question and then we'll move on to uh, dr ravanle for his uh, concluding remarks on the session so uh, akshay if you're if you can hear me can you unmute ashia and then we could probably uh, take up her question as well sure rishan uh, ashia can you please uh, unmute yourself and ask your question live now sure this is last and final call for you to unmute yourself and ask your question live otherwise we'll proceed thank you ishan let's proceed yeah so uh, i must uh, before i give the dais and the and the uh, topic of discussion to uh, dr ravanle i must uh, i'm sorry to interrupt ishan we have a request uh, to have all the questions addressed in q and a box i will leave it on you to see if you can address as far as the logistics at the back end are concerned we've extended it by another hour i leave all it right. on the gentleman uh, i'm sure the panelists have uh, constraints of time so uh, what we'll do is whatever questions that we have received and this is to all the audience members if there are any other questions i've already given my email id you could write to me 
I can forward your questions to the uh, esteemed panelists and we could take it further from there. As of now, I think because of the constraint of time and the paucity of time, we'll move on to the concluding remarks, remarks of Dr. Ravanle. After I congratulate uh, the eminent panelists for dealing with such a complicated discussion with such uh, clarity and softness. So I must uh, thank you all of you for joining us. And uh, must I also uh, thank uh, Dr. Ravanle if our eminent, experienced, and knowledgeable panelists are the flesh and blood of environmental jurisprudence and government and intergovernmental organizations. Uh, Dr. Ravanle is uh, very much the soul which resides in the educational system of India when it comes to environmental jurisprudence. So I must uh, cede the floor to uh, Dr. Ravanle for his concluding remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ishan. And it was indeed a pleasure to hear to the noteworthy wisdom which was so served to us in the form of words formed by statements and then the intelligent way of presentation. But my one introduction, which is that I'm the proud teacher of wonderful students like Isha. So that is my first introduction. And please allow me that I may like to cite some verbs from the ancient jurisprudence. And when we talk about it, so it would be the language Sanskrit. I would, of course, uh, explain it in English as well, and I'll not take more than three minutes. Well, it was indeed a pleasure because there are two words which have been spoken nowadays interchangeably. Either it is regulation or governance. I see that when it comes to courts, then of course it's a regulation. But when it comes to the policy, it lays down the structure for us, for our own governance. And there are two words which people, I feel, as a learner of law, we have forgotten. That is called as adapt and adopt. People just say that let us adapt to the situation, but they do not want to mend their ways and adopt to the ways it will take them further and we will flourish. So today when we are struggling for a better environment, well, the ancient jurisprudence in the form of when it comes to India, Vedas, it has taught us, guided us to take steps for the protection of clean environment. Be it Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, or Athar Veda. They all recognize the importance of maintaining the seasonal cycles that leads to climatic changes, largely due to, I would like to praise, inappropriate human behavior and actions. If you go back to the old days, which we have read in our books, the ancients treated nature holistically, giving utmost reverence to preserving its various entities and elements. Mata Bhumi, Prutuhana Prutvya, Earth is my mother and I am her son. And which son or daughter would like to harm mother. So we started with that. So much was the respect for the mother earth. We always call it as a mother earth. So this look clearly indicates the relationship of humans with earth, comparing it to like a mother and a child, inferring that one should not harm either the environment or its flora and fauna. There were references made to water, in Hindi or Sanskrit, we refer it as Jala. So water from time immemorial has always been an important natural resource, need for sustaining life. Well, in ancient ages, we face problem, but the water availability issue was only in terms of distance. However, today, water availability mm -hmm. itself is a problem with staring scarcity due to excessive pollution. So there is a Matsya Quran 154.512 I would like to cite. Dasha Kupa Sama Vapi Dasha Vapi Samo Vrudaya Dasha Vrudaya Samaha Putro Dasha Putra Samo Druma A pond equals 10 wells and a reservoir equals 10 ponds. A sun equals 10 reservoirs and a tree 
equals 10 cents. So when we talk about it, what does it inform us? That it is our foremost duty that we should take care of the natural resources. The reference to the word sun does not mean what we see as a gender differentiation. It is a term which is just used to bring that closeness between us. So what is given to us by the God Almighty, we have to respect, but yes, we don't have to utilize it, but we also have to stand for its recreation. And that's what all three learned panelists were suggesting to all of us. And why do we require people to tell us why can we not learn it by ourselves? Because somebody was talking the other day with respect to the experiences due to COVID in India or abroad. One news, I don't know, to great extent did not make it to several channels. Some channels did show it, but the water of Ganges, after a long time, were felt to be like the pure Ganges. And nobody, everybody knows the answer, why it is polluted. We know the answer, but we still are trying to figure out the way to reach to that answer. And all the panelists, they have rightfully informed to us about the climate mitigation and adaptation through courts and policy. It always has been a pleasure to hear Honorable Mr. Justice Swatantra Kumar. Well, I have heard, sir, as a student, I have heard student when he visited different institutions, be it in Pune, be it Symbiosis, or be it ILS as well. And occasionally I have visited the National Green Tribunal if some important proceedings were happening and we could sit and just listen to that. And you have made that difference, sir. Whether it was at the Supreme Court of India or different high courts, but greatly I refer that to your tenure at the National Green Tribunal. And thank you very much. We owe that big thank you to you for bringing that rich jurisprudence and the involvement of the persons who have the professional experience as part of the National Green Tribunal. That goes to you, sir. Honorable Mr. Justice Luke, I heard about you, I read about you, but, and when we were deciding about this panel discussion, your name came first. And when I talked to Ishan, Ishan just jumped with it. He said that I know. And I said, we should have. And Dr. Vivek, thank you very much for joining because Ishan talks highly about you, your work and etc. And on behalf of everyone around the world who is attending this panel discussion, I would like to thank you all from the bottom of my heart. And I sincerely enjoyed this session, but with sincere urge to everyone who is participating, we should not be taught how to take care of the environment. We are part of the environment itself. So start taking care of yourself. You will take care of the environment. Thank you very much, everyone. Namaskar. Over to you, Ishan. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ravanle. Uh, again, I would just like to uh, conclude with uh, a bit of a vote of thanks to uh, Justice Kumar, not just for being uh, the green judge of India and, and Asia and the globe, uh, but for every, uh, for including and instilling in every lawyer that want to be an environmental lawyer. And I think if there's a, I cannot think of a better gift uh, to the world of environment than instilling a sense of pride, a sense of curiosity in every young professional to take up environment as a vocation. So thank you so much, Justice Kumar. Uh, uh, Justice Luke, it's just a pleasure to hear your thoughts, your diverse, uh, experience uh, as a lecturer, as a functionary, uh, as a judge has been an incredible uh, beneficial ride for all of us who uh, just latch on to the thought of uh, hearing you speak. So thank you so much for being with us. And Dr. Saxena, your, uh, as I mentioned already, we have, we've, during the course of this talk, we've added uh, various things that you are. So we started with two. Uh, then we reached uh, the trifecta of government, bureaucracy, and intergovernmental organization. And then we also realized that you're also a lawyer. So now you're, you're, you're a combination of various facets and the perfect uh, uh, representative for India 
at the international level uh, at the IUCN or in any other governmental organization. So thank you so much, Dr. Saxena, for having us. Uh, thank you, Lex Witness, for having organized uh, such a wonderful panel. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ramanle. As I mentioned, you're the soul of environmental jurisprudence and education in India. And thank you, finally, to all the participants. The questions were great. I again apologize. We could not take up all the questions, but I will personally get back to you. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. I will now be ending the webinar for yes. all the attendees. Thank you so much for your valuable time. Thank you, everyone.